Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, so I will go directly to the point. What is a MAC? Uh, put it in simple words, a MAC, or magnetocephalography, is the recording of the magnetic fields produced by brain activity. So that's very nice, very simple, but certainly the question arises, where do these fields come from? Or put it more simply, what the hell are we actually looking at, right? Uh, well, I mean, the also simple question is that uh, these fields are primarily generated from the intracellular currents associated with postsynaptic potential. That will be uh, uh, part of the coronal section. And here we have a part of the neocortex. We have uh, the dendritic spine, and uh, due to the postsynaptic uh, potentials, the current goes from uh, the terminal here. And associated to this current, that is well known from electromagnetics, uh, there is a magnetic field that might be recorded uh, outside the skull. The uh, thing is that we need a relatively high number of synchronously firing neurons uh, to be able to record uh, such uh, magnetic fields. That will be around 10 to the 5 pyramidal cells in the neocortex to generate, uh, which is something which is miserable. And also something which is interesting, uh, if we look at the, in more detail to the structure of the neocortex, depending on the orientation of the cortex, there are different types of currents. Here there will be um, radial cortex and here tangential cortex, uh, currents. For this uh, radial cortex, uh, if the uh, brain w were a uh, perfect sphere, uh, we won't have any magnetic field outside. So uh, in principle, we couldn't measure anything here. Uh, so the main contribution of or to make are currents here in the, in the sulci here. And th so that uh, this is uh, in relative contrast to make to uh, EG, sorry, because here in, e in EG we have uh, contribution for both parts of the cortex. Um, these current dipoles, which are normally uh, termed by Q, uh, are of a few nanoparameters and generate magnetic fields of uh, around uh, 100 or so, 10 to Teslas. Uh, but interestingly, it has been demonstrated that <coughs> it is source depth rather than orientation uh, which is the main factor affecting uh, MEG sensitivity. Uh, I, I won't go into details because we have a very nice talk uh, right after mine, so please attend this uh, for details on how deep we can go with uh, MEG. Uh, and this is also in contrast to EG, which is uh, a little bit more sensitive to deeper sources, which uh, I don't know whether this is good or bad, uh, but this is a classical picture uh, showing uh, uh, the strength needed for the uh, the pr detection probability of 70% uh, 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 and as you can see uh, the deeper we go the higher the uh, current dip dipoles we need and also if we look here uh, we need uh, higher currents if we are in the uh, GD than in the sulky but still we can f uh, also detect something because uh, the, the, the brain is not perfectly uh, spheric and uh, we, can, we always have some uh, tangential component that might be detected it is if it is close enough to the surface. So, uh, how can we detect such tiny uh, magnetic fields? Uh, right now, uh, the technology has evolved a lot, and uh, what it is normally used for that is something which is actually a flux to voltage trans transductor, converting uh, a magnetic flux into a voltage or a current that can be uh, amplified and measured by a device. They are normally called uh, superconducting quantum interference devices and use a phenomenon which is called uh, quantum interference. So it goes through uh, this uh, torus. Uh, it uh, induces a tiny current that might be amplified and measured uh, by the sensor. A typical MAC device has many arrays of such squids and will be something like that. We'll have a sensor array, which is aligned to cortical surface, as close to the surface as possible. Uh, we already know that these uh, pyramidal cells here are producing the currents and the magnetic field associated. This magnetic field is picked up by the squids, and uh, they induce a variable uh, current. That is what we normally see in the MEG traces. Uh, normally, modern MEG devices might have more than one type of sensor, especially for example the one here in the laboratory uh, in Madrid uh, with Electa. We have uh, or have uh, 
magnetometers and radiometers, planar gladiometers. Uh, magnetometers are just sensitive to the magnetic field, right? Uh, in every depth below. Of course, uh, more sensitive to shallower sources, but also sensitive to deeper sources. Whereas the planar gladiometers uh, measure the difference between the two of them. So they remove mainly a contribution for deeper sources and just uh, are, are sensitive to shallower sources. So uh, by combining different types of uh, sensors or, or squids, we can target different types of uh, sources of magnetic activity. So a typical MAC device will be like that. Now we will see why we need such a big uh, tube that we're here. Uh, we have the flux going through the squid and producing the electric current. And so a typical source will produce uh, this kind of a spectra. And if you look at the spectra, you will recognize all of you, for instance, coming from the clinic, uh, which is very similar, for instance, to what we find uh, for the EEG. We have the alpha peak here and also a beta peak. And it is actually uh, very, very similar to what we have with the EEG, so it's uh, very easy to recognize. Uh, the big but is the problem that the squid uh, need to work at very low temperatures, uh, around uh, 4 Kelvin, which is uh, actually uh, very, very low. So they need to be cooled by liquid aliens. So we can say that MEG is, very, is cool at the moment. And that's why we have here the need for this big dewer where you have to put liquid helium to keep the squid at a very low temperature. And uh, you'll see this helmet where the subject just put uh, his or her head on. It. And uh, one of the, I would say not a problem, but a thing you have to take into account is that you cannot, uh, contrary to EG, you cannot put the squid, the sensor, completely over the scalp, but there's always a uh, small uh, distance between sensor and, and the scalp. Uh, this might be an issue. Uh, the other thing is that helium needs to be refiled or recycled periodically, which uh, uh, induces some maintenance cost. Uh, but luckily, the latex machines, such, such as electrotrucks, incorporate an internal recycling system that significantly reduces uh, this maintenance. Or you can also work with uh, external recyclings uh, that uh, clearly diminishes the, the cost of uh, the work associated with uh, uh, interestingly, uh, the recent years, uh, there has been some work uh, showing that it might be that uh, MEG could not, could not be cool forever because uh, a new uh, family of uh, magnetic detectors called optically pumped magnetometers uh, are being developed and are sensors able to detect these tiny magnetic fields at room temperature. Uh, then in the thing that they do not need a cooling system uh, allowed to be then to be placed closer to the head and produ producing uh, higher signal to noise ratio because we pick up more signal uh, because the distance could be as low as, in principle, a few millimeters. And this is a uh, recent work from uh, Mark Brooks in, in Nottingham where they compare uh, with simulations what we will find with a uh, typical squid system and uh, simulated uh, optically pumped magnetometers and you can see a higher uh, spatial resolution for the detecting detection of sources and also interestingly a uh, higher signal to noise ratio up to a factor that might be even they say uh, one to five uh, the thing is that so far there are only uh, laboratory prototypes but it might be in the short term I would say five to ten years they might compete with the squid in make application I think it very much depend on how the new machines with the uh, internal recycling system work, because if uh, they are working fine, as, as uh, some of the, our colleagues uh, told us yesterday during the, the meeting, then it might not be so important, uh, this aspect of uh, having the new sensors. But if uh, the prices of helium stay rising and uh, they are interested in this uh, type of uh, magnetometers in other applications, it might be that in a decade or so, we might see these uh, optically pumped magnetometers for a MEG application. Uh, another interesting thing is the need for shielding. Uh, that is because the magnetic field associated to this dipole uh, current I've showed you uh, are very small. And for instance, if we compare 
with the magnetic signal from the human heart, which is very high, and also especially with the CD magnetic earth file, which is a uh, several orders of magnitude greater, uh, that calls for the need to keep all this uh, activity outside uh, uh, the, the recording system. So normally, we have something like that. It's a room shielded by uh, metal with a high uh, magnetic permeability, we call mu metal, so that inside the room you don't have uh, any kind of magnetic activity other than the one from the body itself. Ideal, right? So, all that said, the question will be why MEC? Why not other options? Uh, I will promise to keep it short. Uh, I will try to remain faithful to my promise. So if we compare to fMRI, uh, MEG is a direct measure of neural activity, which is always good. Uh, have an excellent temporal resolution, which allows for the study of dynamics of cognitive process, much in the same way as uh, EG does, and has minimal invasiveness. And also, his uh, uh, spatial resolution is not so bad. But if we compare to uh, EG, we have also advantages, because uh, the signal we pick up is the magnetic field, which is less distorted uh, when going through the uh, school and the scalp, as opposed to the uh, uh, electric potential. I have better signal to noise ratio, especially at higher frequencies, uh, as compared to the EEG, because in, in, in the EEG, the skull acts as a low pass spatial filter. They also have better spatial resolution. And uh, one thing which is important, especially for functional connectivity analysis, uh, this is lack of reference signal as opposed to EEG where we have to look always to differences between two points and uh, use a, a reference that might interfere with the measure. Uh, that's a also a typical graph where we can see where it's MEC as compared to other uh, neuroregion modalities. Uh, in terms of spatial and temporal resolution, you will see here a very good temporal resolution and also not so bad spatial resolution, much better than EEG and uh, not uh, definitely not uh, fMRI, but uh, we have uh, something which is uh, very good. How would be a typical processing pipeline for uh, for Mac? We have the recording of the data. Then we have a first um, process to eliminate all sources uh, of magnetic activity outside the head, such as, for instance, uh, hair activity. Then we have uh, segmentation or trial selection. This is typically pipeline for EEG as well. So uh, there's nothing new here. So you can, all of you coming from EEG, uh, you can use much of your expertise, uh, only working with uh, much better signals. Uh, then you have a visual inspection and filtering, which is also typical. And then you can just analyze the data as if it were a typical multi-channel EEG. One interesting option as well, especially if you, uh, you have an MRI of the subject, is to try to reconstruct the neural sources of activity inside the brain, uh, combining the information from structural MRI to the information of uh, sensor level uh, MEC. You first need the template of the guy or uh, the, the MRI. You define a certain grid where you will look at the information. Then you have the realignment just to put all of them together. Uh, you make a volume conduction uh, model, and uh, you just need to have a estimation of how sources inside the brain project to the sensor, and then use this information to, given the measured signal, try to estimate uh, how these uh, sources are activated. Uh, this is an ill-posed mathematical problem because there are as many solutions, uh, there are a lot of uh, possible solutions, so you have to use some uh, constraint typically that uh, among all solutions you take the one with the minimum variance. Uh, but there are, there are also another options. Uh, and just to finalize quickly, uh, I will talk one uh, slide about clinical application of MEC. And uh, actually, I don't want to spoil the surprise because we will have uh, different talks uh, along uh, this morning. Uh, and in brief, they include, but they are not limited to, epilepsy, which is possibly the, the most uh, important one, and where you can use a MEC to localize epileptic focus in refractory uh, focal epilepsy. We will have two talks at least today about this topic. Uh, we can also use it for Parkinson's disease and uh, deep brain stimulation studies. We also have 
two talks today. Uh, we're going to study a uh, different type of dementia. We also have two talks, and uh, Fernando's lab is a, a world ex expert in this kind of uh, studies. And in general, I would say any disease with a concomitant synaptic disruption that alters neural activity is a good candidate to be studied with MEC. For instance, you can also think of schizophrenia and some other neurological, neurological diseases. So my uh, final advice is if you like this uh, idea or if you come from clinic and you are used to work with EEG, to try yourself to work with MEC. And uh, here in Spain, you can contact Fernando's group. And if you are coming from another uh, part of the world, there are nowadays EEG or MEC machines uh, in uh, many countries. And uh, for myself, coming from EEG field, and now having the possibility to work with MEC data, this is like a whole new world. and. Uh, I am enjoying it very much. So thank you to Alecta and my colleagues from Madrid and also the Ministry for the Funding. Thank you to you all.